Fanchon Silberstein is an educator and writer who designed an innovative workshop, Art and Intercultural Communication for International Audiences. She was director of the US Department of State's Overseas Briefing Center, designing and delivering workshops for employees and families to prepare them for service abroad. She served on the board of the National Multicultural Institute and was a docent for the Smithsonian Institution's uh, Hirschhorn Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, chairing the program during her tenure and assisting museum educators in training new docents. She holds a bachelor's in English and art history from the University of Michigan and a master's in special education from George Washington University. For many years, she lived and worked in Southeast and South Asia and in Brazil. Um, so in the book, Fanchon Silberstein dives into the world of art. And along the way, she teaches you how to look, listen, and reflect, how to engage more meaningfully with art and its makers. Reading this book was in itself a very engaging experience for myself. And so my first question is, uh, Fanchon, what made you write this book? There were actually two very salient reasons for me. One was highly personal, and then the other was my long career and great interest in intercultural communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was uh, planning our session today with Natasha, we decided that I would read a short amount from the, in, the preface of the book, because it really tells you how uh, strong my first attachment was through an art history class at the University of Michigan, highly personal. In my sophomore year at the University of Michigan, I got very sick during a flu epidemic and learned what it was to be weak and vulnerable. I had no idea how apropos this was going to be. At the time, I was taking a survey course in art history that touched on Greek art and had introduced me to the famous statue of the winged victory, a marvelous marble woman. There she is though missing her head, expressed power and to me health through her body. At the end of the semester, the professor asked the students to write about a favorite work and she was it for me. She soared, she was about being alive. She touched me personally and later when I read about her, she taught me about the ancient Greeks. This was the first time I walked into a piece of art and made it my own. It has happened since, though probably without the force I felt as a 19-year-old coming back to life. Walking inside a work of art exposed my feelings and the journey opened another world. It made me curious about the Greeks. The Nike carried me into a culture and its people and led me to understand how, in quotes, art opens a window into a culture's dreams, drives, and priorities revealing aspects of a culture soul that came from, uh, at one time, Michigan's foremost artist, uh, David uh, Barr. <clears throat> I was confronted with many culture souls during years abroad as the wife of an American Foreign Service officer living in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Pakistan, and Brazil. Along the way, when we lived in Washington, DC, I earned a master's degree in special education at George Washington University, in a program that focused less on disabilities than on learning styles. <clears throat> and the reason that I'm reading this is because the learning styles part of, of that piece of my education probably affected me as much as anything that I was learning. People see differently and particularly children. Uh, we studied perception, which is of course a part of that, how beliefs shape the ways we see and we were cautioned against thinking we understood children's views before letting them talk. I learned the value of asking respectful questions. And that played very well into my interest in designing programs while I was still at the State Department, but then later independently with a close colleague, using art as a form of intercultural communication. And eventually we started teaching at the Summer Institute for intercultural communication in Portland, Oregon, where we saw students from all over the world and really realized how vital the arts are as a way to open thinking 
into worlds that we know nothing about. Before I ever started writing, a friend of mine gave me a quote from Marcel Proust that was really one of the springboards for me. Proust said, through art alone, are we able to emerge from ourselves to know what another person sees of the universe. So in your book, uh, you masterfully juxtapose art from different times, backgrounds, cultures, styles. And I thought you really did a great job um, when trying to not be biased and not prioritizing one art over another. You really have a great selection there. Um, so the book is very well structured. Uh, it has 12 chapters, each one exploring an important element on the journey you are taking your reader through. So can you tell us why you organized your book in the way you did? And maybe more importantly, how you chose the art to go into it? I imagine that was not an easy job. Well, there was such an amazing amount of material, as you may imagine. The entire book is really about engagement and about communication. And the table of contents is very carefully annotated in order to express that. Uh, the first chapter is called the original Skype as a way to bring the communication part right into the present moment. But those things that were in the, if you will, original Skype were the cave paintings, the pyramids, uh, the great pieces that came from antiquity, like the one that you just saw that had affected me so, so powerfully. So the book is really about the way we come to a piece of art and how we can open ourselves to be spoken to through the visual information that's there, which then leading to the curiosity that it should inspire encourages us to go forward into really learning. So much of what we're taught in conventional education is one-way communication, lecture from expert to learner. And there's real value in that. But when you're curious and you've had a powerful experience or you know that you want to know, then the possibilities are endless. And the chapters one by one really address that. In chapter two, uh, figure things out. Um, you talk about using space in the paintings and more specifically the absence of something and silence. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, and so here, and you can see it on the screen, you give exa two examples, a Japanese painting on your left, uh, carp and turtles, and an American one by George Siegel bus riders on your right. Can you please talk more about those two paintings? These paintings were so helpful to me in dealing with the concept of silence, which is useful, valuable, and necessary in most cultures. The, the, but in Japan, it is such an important part of art and also of communication at many levels. This uh, particular piece, Carp and Turtles, also has a follow-on to it. This is Carp and Turtles Without End. And it's in the Portland Art Museum and was there then when I needed to use it for my students. It sat on the floor. And one of the reasons for it being placed low is because it was to prepare people for the tea ceremony, for the silence that they would participate in while they watch the very detailed preparations for tea. It's an underwater scene, fish swimming, turtles, utter silence. So the environment itself is silent. The other piece is more contemporary, done by the artist George Siegel and done at the time of the civil rights movement in, uh, in the US when a lot of things were going on. One of the most famous was the incident of Rosa Parks, who boarded a bus, was told because she was Black to go to the back. She didn't. She insisted on taking a seat or either or maybe she was asked to stand. I can't remember. Uh, and Siegel was much affected by that. But here's a different kind of silence because the four people in this sculpture are life-size, absolutely life-size. 
because instead of using conventional armatures, uh, Siegel used human beings themselves. I used to wonder what it was like to be a friend of his because you would ask to be loaded up with plaster and placed in a particular position until he decided to remove the plaster. Nobody I know was ever injured by this. But in any case, he was very careful in his choices of the people, how he wanted them seated, how he wanted their posture to convey the silence that would normally not take place among a chatty group of people sitting close to each other, in this case on a bus, and it's obvious not just from the title, but he appropriated real bus seats. We can see that there was an effect of the silence here by people who were perhaps observing something that made them uncomfortable or because they were living through an historical moment in retrospect now uh, that had profound effects on the entire culture. In chapter number six, uh, you, which is called The Capture, I found it very interesting. So in this chapter, you bring the example of students in conflict resolution, coming to the Hirschhorn Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art for a very special session, learning to master conflict resolution basically through engaging with art. And I remember reading your book and you say that students felt confused in the beginning. They didn't know why they were brought here. What was the purpose of it? And the whole experience turned out to be fascinating for all of them. And you actually personally led those sessions. Can you tell us more about your experience with this? It was a very interesting experiment that we then were able to carry on through many classes because it proved to be useful. Uh, these were all students in master's programs in conflict resolution in local universities here in Washington. We brought them into the Hirschhorn, and the idea was that we would make conflict very conscious that conflict was likely going on within their own groups, among them, but also in their uh, confrontation, I will call it, with confusing art. This is a fairly recognizable piece of sculpture, but much of what they were looking at was fairly abstract. And we had a lot of reason to deal with their conflicting feelings, which they later had to write about in, their, in the classroom. The piece that you're looking at here is by Rachel White Reed and is just called Untitled Library. Most of the, and I led the, the conversation by leading in with a, a question about what they actually were seeing. And a couple of them very usefully said, well, we thought this was just a regular bookshelf, and so we walked right by it. But when you look harder and look very, very carefully, there's a lot of detail here that is full of narrative. For one thing, and I'm going to summarize, uh, we took a, a long time with this, perhaps half an hour of discussion. There are the remnants of books that look like they've been torn from the shelves. The pieces are made of dental plaster and are very fragile, which is a significant part of reading any art. What is the material? Is it fragile? And why did the artist choose that? Uh, the tops, as you can see, are tooth-like. They look like they've already been broken. And what we went to, uh, through with the students, which was so revealing and fascinating to me, is that they arrived at the meaning of the piece, even though they didn't know why it was made. It was actually made as a prototype for a, a Holocaust memorial that later came in different form in Vienna. And the idea of books being snatched away, taken away, knowledge burned. And I remember saying to the group of students, what else is missing here? And somebody said, people, the people are not here who would read a book. You're getting now uh, in a snapshot form an overview of this piece rather than the dynamic that took place in the group because I asked a few questions but they mostly conversed among themselves and worked out together what their various perceptions were of this piece. And then when we debriefed it, we were able to talk about conflicting feelings, how they felt about what other people in the group were saying, and so on. It all played into the, the usefulness, I hope, when they went back to the classroom. Yes, I also like how you say 
Uh, this experience helped uh, students in conflict resolution to simply see, observe, listen, and see the perspective and avoid judgment. And you conduct another interesting uh, experiment in your book. And uh, let me bring this up. So in chapter five, Art and Dialogue, you make two pictures literally talk to each other. And so here you can see on the screen an Iranian garden on your left and an American diner on your right. And so can you maybe walk us through this process? So how did you come up with this idea? And what do you want to tell the reader with this um, experiment? Well, this was the first classroom exercise that I conducted. I had uh, each of these images, one from the, uh, the Freer Museum here in Washington, the other from the Hirshhorn, also in Washington, the two paintings come from extremely different time periods and from the 16th century and from the 20th century from vastly different cultures. And that was the intention of using these two pieces together. But we started separately asking with the Iranian garden to simply describe what was there. Gertrude Stein said that description is explanation. And I've tried that with myself many times in a puzzling situation. It can be with a perfectly familiar person or uh, an object that you see. When you begin to describe, you begin to pay attention to the details. So what they did in describing this was to realize that the tree was very prominent. The people were gathered together in very close proximity, but really in 50% of the painting, that what is, you can't see here is that there is water, uh, that the sky is yellow and the tree is autumnal. The difference with the diner is that it's a city scene. It has very little nature in it, just a few trees way in the background. It has three telephone booths, remember those? The doors are open. The phones are there, but nobody is communicating the way they are in the other uh, in the other picture. The diner itself is blocked. Uh, the door is closed, and we don't see anybody inside. It's a little bit like the seagull in the sense that a bus can be a very noisy place if people are chatting, and diners are typically places where people meet, and telephone booths certainly where people went to speak. So it gave the groups a chance to look very carefully, to then very uh, carefully move on to an interpretation of what they thought was going on. And then finally, at the end, to talk about what they liked, whether uh, they would rather be in one environment to the, uh, than the other, or were some people more worthy than others because they lived in environments like this. So that it ended with subjectivity. And then a small lecture at afterwards on the origins of the paintings, who made them, how they were made, and so on. The idea was that these two cultures, vastly different, really emblematic of a lot of, that we're living with right now, could speak to each other with very careful, detailed, respectful questioning. I was very affected by a book, a very slim little book called On Dialogue by David Bohm, who is a, a famous uh, physicist who wrote, some, wrote on uh, wholeness and the implicate order and was very, very enchanted with the idea that true dialogue had a physics to it. And that was that if one speaks and somebody else also speaks, but in reference to the thing that you're saying, a third thing emerges. More, most often, we're in a position where we're trying to convince somebody of our own truth, and that can stop a conversation. But what Bohm demonstrated in this book is that that what he called true dialogue, where the third thing is allowed to emerge, then new things can happen. And don't forget, I was doing intercultural training using art. And my objective really was to open thinking and allow curiosity to arise and learn something about 
the cultures that produce the kind of work that they do. If you don't mind, Fanchon, maybe we can come back to my previous question about the conflict resolution students, because we just got a follow up question from Victoria, who wonders if you ever spoke to any former students who went abroad and used something that they used from her from your class in the real world experience. It's a wonderful question. And the answer is, I don't think I did in that specific way. What did happen with the conflict resolution students is that they had to go back to their classrooms on every occasion and answer three questions. What did you, what did you see in the museum? How did you feel about it? And what does this have to do with conflict resolution? So in an organized way, yes, I did get feedback. And I still have the papers. They were invaluable to me when I was writing. One person I, I, I have to submit, a, a man said, I learned I am a very judgmental person. <laughs> um, in the chapter four, which is called Whose Lens, um, you talk about perspective, how we look at art. And you bring an example of Cubist multiple perspectives. I found that very interesting. Can you talk a little more about that? Well, cubism is a puzzle to a lot of us. I, it was very experimental. The idea was to allow time and space to be seen simul in simultaneous manner. And it's still uh, very controversial whether these artists achieved that. But in fact, they were coming into a world where things were moving a lot faster. There was a great deal of interest in what it would be like to look at things in the way that perhaps Einstein was seeing them. They were referring to science in a lot of ways. And they, they did a great deal that was very experimental and in some cases, very beautiful. There was, were collages and there were sculptures that flickered in the light and were meant to introduce the idea that there are multiple perspectives on just about anything. I, I read, in a book that I, I recommend to anybody that's interested because it's a very accessible book called Art and Physics by Leonard Schlein. He mentions that biography is a form of cubism because the biographer, the writer has an opportunity to look at one thing, a person and examine that person from many, many perspectives and then bring it back together in one book, a la one sculpture or painting. Um, a couple of times in your book, uh, you mentioned that we tend to turn away from what confuses us from something we may not understand straight away. And this is especially true with modern art. I found it very interesting what you said about reading abstraction in chapter nine, which is called When Art Speaks, Listen. So can you elaborate on that? And I'll bring um, the next slide up. We're looking now at an abstraction that puzzles a lot of people or much of his work does, Mark Rothko. I do want to precede this by saying that art is not a puzzle, it's a mystery. It is made for many reasons in many ways and is meant to address us through the artist's imagination and to have our imaginations join that. So figuring something out is not always the best way to approach a piece of art. Often the best way is to approach ourselves through it, to ask yourself what you're seeing. Now in a reproduction of Rothko, we can't see what one of the most important things is about his making. And that is that these are veils of color that are applied one on top of the other. In the reproduction, it pretty much looks like lavender at the bottom, yellow at the top, and white in the middle with a black line. And that's what it is, but there's a lot more going on. This is absolutely demands slow looking because our retinas, our vision needs to adjust to the painting in order to see the layers and to then participate. Rothko was a practitioner of Zen Buddhism and very interested in going inward. And it's one of the things that he's really asking of his viewers. Anybody who lives here or has been to the Phillips Museum, the Phillips Gallery, knows that there is a room of Rothko's where the lighting is very carefully adjusted and where people are really invited to sit quietly and look. It's not to 
delve into absolute meaning, but really to look back at the self. Guess who? <laughs> Jackson Pollock. Uh, he's sort of the emblem of, he's the poster child for the most confusing art of all. And uh, I looked today online, I was curious to know what I might find because I'm as puzzled by Jackson Pollock as anybody. And there's a wonderful short video on the piece that was bought for, I think it was $2 million back in the day in Australia, when Australians were absolutely outraged that this was purchased. I don't have to tell you what's happened with prices, which is practically nothing to do with anything. But what happened with Pollock is that he invented a new way of painting on the ground, pouring, moving things around with a stick. It was, if there was a narrative here, and I, by the way, I believe that there's a narrative in almost everything that we bring ourselves to a piece of art. It's a narrative about paint. How does paint behave? What happens when you let a layer dry and then apply another layer? Or what happens if you don't wait until it dries and you try to mix? Uh, artists are very familiar with these, these issues when they're, when they're working. I also mentioned that these 20th century artists were living through a time when things were very much speeded up. Planes went faster, cars went faster, trains did. And now if you think about the, the latest thing that's happening in space with a telescope that is going further away than we have ever been, there are perceptions of the universe that are not fathomable by any other means than these experiments. It's not so much figuring it out, it's applying one's vision and excitement and puzzlement to what the universe looks like. And just one other thing that's interesting about Pollock, some of the, the work is not framed. And I heard a curator once say that the reason for that is that these are images of infinity, so that by not enclosing it in a frame, you allow the suggestion that the painting itself goes on and on. I also remember in your book, you, um, you mentioned that some people come back from a modern art museum and say, my kids can do better, but uh, that the main difference is that artists, they have a message to communicate in whatever style they choose. Um, throughout your book, but more specifically in, uh, uh, chapter 12, in other worlds, you say that it's important to be aware and understand cultural differences. First, to be able to understand art. But at, at the same time, and here I quote you, art addresses us personally. It doesn't lecture to masses of people. I found this is so well said. Do you want to add anything to this observation? And you also asked me to bring this uh, painting. I'm glad you quoted that because the tendency in uh, looking at things that seem emblematic of a culture is to think that, well, this all came from uh, deep cultural attitudes and values, which it did. So therefore, everybody who's looking at it will have the same experience. And in fact, everything belongs in its context and in its time and space and in a way belongs to us as beholders of what this art is. The reason that uh, we're using Grandma Moses is because I actually literally had an experience in my intercultural training in Oregon with um, in the museum there. They had a, an exhibition of Grandma Moses and I took my students there and it all seemed so obvious, so sweet. Uh, here's a, uh, a snow scene uh, this one is called Catching the Thanksgiving Turkey uh, that has a certain romantic appeal to it, although I imagine it's not wonderful going out on a snowy day to try to catch a turkey. But there it is, and people are cooperating in an endeavor to prepare a feast. This is a culture in which, or a, a time in most cultures, when we made the things that we needed we didn't have an excess of things around us. Uh, you quilted, you built cabins, uh, you milked cows, you grew the things that you needed. And 
it was very, the community itself was very interdependent. Well, going around the corner, this literally happened at the art museum. I brought the students then to this next piece. <laughs> uh, this is a 99 cent store by the German artist, Andreas Gursky. It's digitalized. It's probably a pretty big store and it's probably got a lot of this stuff in it, but uh, it's not quite that big. Here's the excess. This is the cultural contrast that we were really getting at. And back in the classroom then, we were able to talk about how people are formed by those places where they live, what they really value. And again, we can come back to the Iranian garden scene contrasted with the, the bright chrome uh, diner that was in the other painting. It's not a matter of what's best or what's right or wrong. It's a matter of how people live and what they see and then how they, they react to those things that are around them. Before I move ahead with my next question, I would like to come back to Pollock. And I received this very interesting comment from Patricia. At the University of Michigan, um, a former art history chair, um, Rick Axum, that was his name, uh, he would take students outside to try and replicate Pollock because everyone thought they could do better. What they learned actually was that, no, we could not do it better than Pollock. <laughs> Thank you for this comment. <laughs> I thought that was great. Very useful. Thank you. And so my very last question here is, um, one of the main lessons one learns from reading your book is to ask questions. And so what, what are the main questions someone in by someone, I mean, you know, we, we don't all have formal education in art and history of art. Sometimes we may feel a little intimidated in museums and art galleries and may wonder whether our opinion even matters because we don't have that formal art education, right? So for people like that, uh, can you tell us, and I know it's, it's hard to sort of summarize your book in a couple of sentences, but what are the questions people should start with? Well, I, what I want to start with is the excitement that we can experience when we do start asking questions and wait for the answers, by the way. But I also want to start from a quote with, uh, from a writer friend who I think may be on right now. She said, place curiosity on the Olympus of life's secrets. Even if we're not curious in the beginning, when we ask a first question, it can open a conversation that makes us curious, but that means that we have to wait for the answer and without inserting ourselves. Sometimes the biggest crush to a conversation is to say, well, I have that, or I did that. But to rather go with what it is that the person who's expressing their interest, their desire is talking about, and then to go further with that. I say in the book, and this is true, that questions make us powerful. They can be manipulative, and that's not what I mean, but they give us a sense of authority in the world when we're approaching something with the kind of open heart that allows us to ask a question. We're all judgmental, and we all seek meaning. I mean, that's why these paintings are so challenging. What do they mean? We all want to know that, and it's so normal for us to be seeking that. Apropos of that, I'm going to hold up a book. I have no uh, interest in this, but it's a, a children's book. Can, uh, can I, it's called The Dot. I, mean, I wonder if anybody here is familiar. I see some heads saying yes. I've given this to a lot of new babies. It's, um, it's a book about a little girl who can't draw. And so she is encouraged by the teacher to make a dot. And the dot grows and becomes really wonderful. Series of dots, more dots, dots put together. And then dots that are no dots. And that is a bunch of dots that are around an empty space, the, the shape of a dot. Uh, there are so many cultures where you don't say negative space, you say potential space. Because those open spaces are communicative in, the, in even more powerful ways sometimes than the object itself, which is, is present. To me, this opens the possibility of, of a question. What is in that space? 
when you're looking at a Rothko, one way to go forward is to go forward into the space and ask yourself what's your experience. The last thing I'll say, there is a, a play that some of you may have seen called Red, which is about the life of Rothko. And in the very first scene, and I quote this in the book, his assistant, his new assistant comes in and Rothko screams at him, what do you see? And the, the kid starts to elaborate on what's in the painting and Rothko just gets all exercised and screams louder, no, no, what do you see? And what that does is, is keep us present. To piggyback on what uh, the, the book that Fanchon just showed, it says somebody, Odile is asking, she'd like to take the, her grandson to the National Gallery of Art. They're both six and four years old. And do you have a recommendation on how to go about it for the first time? That's because you showed that book that you said you were offering to the babies. Yes, I actually used to buy these at the National Gallery. And I'm sorry to say it's, uh, they've closed the bookstore. I, but it is available. I bought it at Politics and Prose. Um, so what was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, what would I suggest for, I would suggest this for any of us. We walk in front of an object and we just say, well, what is this? What do you see? And it doesn't matter whether we're looking at a blue square or whether we're looking at a cow in Grandma Moses's backyard. We're going to start with the visual material. And it's another object lesson is that art is a visual medium. And we should start with that, not with the label. Part of when uh, I had made a note here, but didn't get to it on the perception side, on perspective, think of the number of perspectives you're getting when you walk into an art museum. You have yours, you have the artists, you have the curators, you have the other paintings in the room and you have the labels. And a lot of us are very compelled to start with the labels because we want to know things. It's so normal. But if you do start with a label, then it's nice to go back to the picture and notice what you're looking at. So I would do that with a child, but I would do that with anybody, me included. Shall we move first ahead with our second part of the event and address those paintings some of you sent to us? I think we'll do that right now. So um, I will put them up in the order I received them from you. So this is the time for you to unmute yourself and to say a couple of words. Just try to be as concise as possible, please, because we're running out of time. And just answer a simple question. How does the painting speak to you? What was in this painting that made you bring it up? Here we go. The first one I have here is Jan Komsky, Watercolor, and I believe that's Melanie Laforce who sent it to us. Melanie, do you want to unmute yourself and say a couple of words? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So, so uh, do, do people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So Jan Komsky was a uh, survivor of um, the concentration camps. But what I love about this painting is um, he he survived and he came to DC and then he he started to paint. He, he was he was an artist and that's how he actually survived um, the camps. He painted portraits of the officers. And um, but what I see here is you you look at the sky and the clouds and the sea and there's a, a sensitive uh, brightness to air. And I I feel when I look at the painting as if I can breathe. And I think um, he's done some other work. He's passed away recently. Uh, and I, I found this in a little art frame shop here in Arlington and I found out about him, you know? So it's just, a, to me, a, a gem, you know? So that's all. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you. So the next one we have here um, is by an artist from Port-au-Prince, a 80. Ismael, and I believe that was Gabrielle Dujour who sent this to us. Gabrielle, are you here? Do you, would, would you like to yes. say anything? Yes, I'm here. Hi. This painting, I bought it five years ago. Um, I was about to move to DC and I was looking for something to bring with me from Haiti. I'm from Haiti, as a matter of fact. 
I was looking for something to bring with me in DC that would remind me of my home country, bring some color and things like that. And rather than going to a gallery, um, I went in the streets. Um, there are many, you find a lot of arts in the streets in Haiti. So I went in the, the street downtown in Port-au-Prince and as I was walking by, I saw this painting and the color was so vivid that I was like, wow, I do want this. And when I looked at it, it has several elements that for me speaks to Haitian culture. You have the drum, the guitar, but also you looking at different shape of a woman head with the earrings and things like that. And you have a pot somewhere here. And I was like, yes, this is definitely something that speaks to me and seems to me very representative of Haitian culture. So I bagged it, I bought it. And then when I'm looking at the name of the artist, something that's making me sad is like, we have so many artists in Haiti that are producing so many beautiful things. And unfortunately they do not have the support that they would need to present their arts and things like that. And, you know, make their marks as an artist in the world. But I really, really like this one. And, I, and, I, and I'm very glad that I brought it with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Um... So here's the next one. And I believe that's um, Eric uh, Cipriano who sent it. Uh, so how does the painting speak to you? Um, what is the Im impact it has on you? Eric, are you here? I'm sorry, I can't see uh, all of you. So that's why I'm just calling your name. And if you're here, we would like to hear from you. And Sean, the OBC still misses you. And Ray Lucky says hi. Um, I remember when this painting came out, um, it was very controversial. Myra is, there's a backstory to the story to this painting. Uh, Myra killed all her children, and the painting is at the Cape. And the question is, is whether we should look at art where there's tragedy implied. There's not implied tragedy, there was actually tragedy. This is her mugshot. But it was produced into art, so it, it, it's the question of how art provokes. Also. You know, what is it provoking us? What it causes us to do, and what does it cause us to see? That it's it's not a when you hear the story behind it, it's not an easy piece to look at. It, it's unsettling. So that's why I recommend we you look at art in a different. Way. So thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Eric. I don't know if, if all of you know that Myra Hindley was a serial killer, a British serial killer, and um, I think we couldn't hear you, Eric, very well, but I think your main point was you said that some art provokes you, right? Um, maybe we can come back to that a little later, but let me move ahead. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, here we have uh, Vermeer, the milkmaid, and I believe this is Kathleen Lash who sent it. Uh, good evening, Kathleen. Would you like to say anything? Okay, maybe Kathleen is not here with us tonight. Uh, in this case, I'll give a chance to other people who sent um, their favorite art. And um, this is Van Gogh, The Starry Night. And let me see, Nancy Reed. Nancy, are you with us? I am here. Yes, um, great. Good evening. Uh, I love this painting because uh, when I was in grammar school, we had an art teacher who came once a month. And sometimes she brought small notebook sized pictures of famous paintings. But this particular time, she gave us each a small poster board and some paints. And we all got to do our own version of the starry night. Uh, and I was a pathetic artist, but it just grabbed me. And ever since then, whenever I see a reproduction or even when I'm fortunate enough to see the, the, uh, the original, um, it's just, an experience of childhood and art and the way I love things to be. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you to everyone for sharing your experiences with these paintings. 
Uh, Fanchon, would you, shall I give it back to you? Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm really moved by some of the, the comments that you've made. I'm just starting with the, the last one, uh, making something your own, uh, having the, the participation that you did brought, brought you closer to the, the visual piece itself and made, I hope it made you curious, but it's the idea of a small child who walks forward towards something. It isn't, it isn't about reproducing it or being a fine artist or getting everything right. It's really about the imagination and the experience that's so direct. I'm, I'm with the um, with the a lovely seascape in the uh, in the beginning. You use the expression "I can breathe better." We all have our own very personal reactions to the things that are around us, and certainly to paintings that can open deep sensation, and that's a very profound one: the breath of life. Uh, the, the Haitian piece is redolent of, of a culture that the person who brought it has left and is not there now. Uh, this, this piece holds that memory in, in a very, I'm sure, personal and deep way, and I hope is consoling because of the separation. Uh, the milkmaid, I'm sorry that that person isn't here. It's another example of silence and the, the concentration of watching something very, very carefully happen. But that figure has an inner life. And there's so much in Vermeer that uh, leads to speculation about who these people are and how they lived and what, what's the backstory here. Uh, and then the... Um, uh, I, oh, the, the mug shot. I had no idea that that's what that was from. There's so many ways to look at tragedy. Uh, and this one, now that I understand what we're really looking at here, it has a, another layer of tragedy. But I saw this before when we were planning the session and could see that this was, if not a suffering human being, then somebody uh, perhaps confronting us uh, there had a, an air of mis misery in it for me, just looking at it the way I did. Yeah, thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Fanchon. This is absolutely fascinating. Somebody just said it was such a wonderful uh, workshop. Uh, we have a question from student Louis, whom I recognize from his last name. Uh, so uh, Louis would like to know, how do you convince people about the relevance of art in a world that prizes efficiency? what is fast and what is functional. And he just wants to let you know also that he just book, he purchased your book and is looking forward to reading it. I am probably not the person to ask about convincing somebody. Uh, well, I would like to convince people to go forward, to have the direct experience, to gain the curiosity that that will open and then to go further. Art is, if not the most powerful way to enter other worlds than has to be closer to the top, the closest thing that I can think of. I, I'm, I don't think you can convince anybody to go to an art museum if they would rather go skateboarding, but nonetheless, it's there. And I hope that the experience will be open to, to more and more people. A question from Lourdes. Uh, what are the changes that you have seen, Fanchon, uh, in regards to our current reliance in technology and in its impact on how we view art? Uh, technology is playing heavily now into the production of art in the most inventive, wonderful ways. Uh, computer uh, imaging uh, has brought some things forward so that it can be manipulated. Photography has turned into a whole different and larger endeavor than it was ever thought it would be in the very beginning when artists disparaged it because they felt that it didn't have the human hand in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm very alert to this and very excited about some of the things that I think are, are turning out to be possible. You know, I, I'm just reminded of something. A number of years ago, the Hirshhorn, when I was there as a docent, did uh, an exhibition they called Visual Music. And uh, they showed how artists tried to cross the senses. So they were doing static pieces that hung on the wall that were not in themselves mu musical, but 
gave the sense of what music might look like if we could visualize it. And they said at the time that the only, now they can do MRIs, I guess, and they can really try to understand what synesthesia, the crossover of the senses is all about. But Kandinsky was in that exhibition, lived before the MRI, but they, the experts are able to look at that and say that he was able to, um, to actually put down on canvas visual music. So I'm mentioning that in respect to technology because now they can learn more about that particular aspect. Now, how that's going to play out, I leave that to the artists, but I think there are marvelous ways ahead of us. Just think what, what that telescope is going to do and how artists are going to respond to it. And thank you, Fanchon, for that. Melanie just uh, said something about having synesthesia, which I also have. Uh, she says that she sees colors and lights and, and shapes uh, listening to music, which I also do, but needs the notes and the, the words actually. So, so uh, I, but I see in colors. So if I listen to music, I see colors. And if I, if I, if I speak or if I hear some you know, voices and bizarrely, they change colors depending on the language as well, because the tonalities are different. It's really linked to, to music. Uh, um, yeah. uh, there's a question from Robbie. Uh, interpreting a work of art is different for each of us as we view paintings in a museum. How can we enhance our appreciation based on our own experiences, the visual medium itself, the subject matter? Are our experiences um, uh, the, mo the most important? I think our experience, uh, it may not be exactly our experience, but our capacity to approach something that we may not be familiar with, but even if we are, with a, enough curiosity to begin to ask the first question. Uh, it's, it's an amazing process that most of us ignore. We're going a lot faster, probably uh, in respect to art and everything else than, than will allow us to enter into that full experience. And what was the first part of the question, Sarah? Uh, how can we enhance our appreciation based on our own experiences, the visual medium itself and the subject matter? I think it, it's probably too complicated a question for me to answer. I don't know everything about that process, but I, I would like to go to a museum with you. How would that be <laughs> a practice? <laughs> We have a question for, from Rene, who's also a member of the Alliance Française, and I'm not sure whether she's addressing the question to you, Fanchon, or to, to Natasha and I, but I will say it out loud. Do you think that the pandemic has opened new opportunities to reach new audience through Zoom presentations, and do you think it will continue? As, as Alliance Française, Rene, I can tell you that we're not reopening yet. For, first of all, there were 200 people who, uh, more than 200 people who signed up for this event today with Fanchon and see of you, you who know the, the building at uh, Wyoming Avenue. Before the pandemic, we were 55 like sardines in a tin box, you know, very, very tight. And so, of course, that is not possible again ever, probably. So we're working to equip the library at Alliance Francaise with, with a system that will allow us to have 20 people in person with social distancing and fully vaccinated and boosted and masked, as you can imagine, for probably a few more years. And then uh, the, 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 that event would be at the same time live streamed to all of you, uh, thanks to Zoom and Knit Bar, et cetera. So that is for Alliance Francaise. Now, maybe Fanchon has a comment to make about Zoom presentation as, as a teacher or an artist. Uh, my only comment is that I will really welcome the day when I can meet a group in person. I, I've said this to several people. I, I love to feel the breath in the room, you know, the life among the people who are there and to have informal exchanges. It's, uh, it's a lot more difficult on Zoom, but I'm grateful for it because we wouldn't be doing this at all without it. We, we would never be able to have 200 people. Uh, even then, right now, we're 109. Some people have dropped off since the beginning. But we would not be able to even have 100 uh, because of the certificate of occupancy at Alliance Française. So, so be prepared to be on Zoom for, for, for a while. And I will leave the, the Natasha to, to wrap up the event. And thank you very much to all of you uh, for, for having, uh, having come today. And thank you all also to Elena Grant, who just send a link about the Scriabin Museum, um, the color and light and music, which is quite famous actually. So um, thank you, thank you, Elena, for that. Natasha, up to you.
Thank you, Sarah. I just also wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Fanchon for joining us tonight for this virtual journey through art. I really encourage you to read the book if you haven't done so. It is really a very engaging experience. I absolutely loved it. And I thank every one of you for joining us. And I hope to see you soon for our uh, cultural events online. I just want to say a word of thank you to both Sarah and Natasha, with whom I've had several planning sessions. It's just been a joy, Natasha. And thank you so much for reading closely, asking such salient questions. It was really wonderful for me. Thank you. A bientôt. <laughs>